Without question, Terry Donahue is the greatest coach in UCLA football history, and arguably the greatest in the history of the Pac-12. From 1976 to 1995, Donahue won 151 total games, 98 conference games, both Pac-12 records, and five conference titles. But out of all the seasons Donahue coached, the craziest had to be 1982, the year he won his first Pac-10 title. In 1982, UCLA managed to win the Pac-10 title over USC, Washington, and Arizona State in what just might be the craziest finish to a title race in college football history. Strap in tightly because honestly, y'all gotta hear the story of the 1982 Pac-10 title race, the most exciting, thrilling finish in the history of college football. Let's take a glance at each of these teams prior to the season. Terry Donahue was coming into his seventh season hell-bent on winning his first Pac-10 title as a head coach. After 54 seasons of sharing the LA Memorial Coliseum with USC, UCLA finally had a place to call their own, the Rose Bowl. Donahue made it very clear his number one priority was getting UCLA a home bowl game. Arizona State was hell-bent on vengeance. The Sun Devils received a postseason ban for 1981 after getting caught for academic and recruiting violations, one of which included literally offering a recruit land. Some teams never learn. This stung hard because ASU finished 9-2 and and 16th in the AP Top 20. They knew they had the talent to make their first Rose Bowl in just their fifth year as a member of the Pac-10. Washington was looking for something far greater than just their third consecutive Rose Bowl. They wanted a national championship. They were ranked second in both the AP and UPI preseason polls, trailing Pitt in each, and looked poised to win their first title in program history. USC was coming off a 1981 in which they lost the Fiesta Bowl and finished 9-3, and, and they looked like they could give Washington a run at the Rose Bowl bid, but they had a bit of a problem. Like Arizona State the year prior, USC was on probation in 1982, barring them from the UPI poll and the postseason. This meant that if USC won the Pac-10, the conference would send its second place team to the Rose Bowl. Now, before I jump into the actual season itself, I want to note one really annoying thing about the conference schedules. Unlike today, not all teams played the same number of conference games. In 1982, UCLA, Arizona State, USC, and Washington State played seven conference games, while the rest of the conference played eight. This lack of standardization for Pac-10 schedules didn't end until 1991, and it made this title race even crazier. The race for the title heated up in Week 8, so here's a quick run-through of everything before then. Washington entered Week 8 7-0 and 4-0 in conference play, having cruised past Arizona, Oregon, Cal, and Oregon State. They were atop the UPI poll and second in the AP poll after this start, keeping them well within reach of the national title. Arizona State opened their season a week earlier than most during a time now dubbed Week Zero. They also entered Week 8 7-0 and, coming off their Week 7 bye, were 3-0 in conference play. They were 7th in the AP Top 20, but strangely were unranked in the UPI poll. They weren't prevented from it. UCLA entered Week 8 unbeaten, but not untied. They were 6-0-1 and 3-0-1 in conference play, blemished only by a 24-24 Week 5 home tie versus Arizona. USC began the season with a 17-9 road loss to Florida, but rattled off five straight wins to enter Week 8 6-1 and 3-0 in conference play. Week 8 was the first in which any of the four teams matched up. UCLA was at home facing the hapless Ducks of Oregon, who were winless on the year but were coming off a shocking tie of number 15 Notre Dame. Washington was at Stanford, and that was not an easy game. Stanford may have lost to San Jose State earlier in the season, but they'd also beaten Ohio State and came in with a 4-3 overall record. Stanford also had All-American quarterback John Elway under center, and he'd been getting tips from former Stanford QB Jim Plunkett while NFL players were on strike. The big matchup was happening in Tempe, as USC was taking on Arizona State. A win would keep the victor on the most direct path for a title, while a loss would take fate out of their hands. To nobody's surprise, UCLA crushed Oregon 40-12. Arizona State beat USC 17-10, and to make matters worse, USC lost starting QB Sean Salisbury to an injury midway through the third quarter. But the biggest story was Stanford's 43-31 upset of Washington. Stanford lost its starting and backup fullbacks a few minutes into the game and trailed 17-7 midway through the second quarter. However, a Mike Dodderer 46-yard touchdown run began a massive scoring rally that had the Cardinal up 20 midway through the third. 
John Elway had one of the most incredible games of his college career and made the cover of next week's Sports Illustrated. This loss knocked Washington out of contention for the national title and into third place in the Pac-10 behind ASU and UCLA. To compound things for Washington, they had the toughest matchup of any team in Week 9. While USC had Cal and Arizona State had Oregon State, Washington had UCLA in a critical game for both sides. A UCLA win would end the Huskies' chase for a Pac-10 title, while a Washington win would put the Bruins on the ropes and without a chance to control their own destiny. USC won 42 to nothing, and ASU won 30 to 16 over their mismatched foes, as was expected. In the critical game of the week, Washington led 10 to 0 late in the fourth, but with 5:37 to go, UCLA scored on a 39-yard TD from Tom Ramsey to JoJo Townsend. After forcing a punt with a little over three minutes to go, UCLA drove to try and at least tie the game. However, UCLA's chances died when Bill Stapleton jarred loose a fourth down pass intended for Danny Andrews with 25 seconds to go, sealing a 10-7 Husky victory. Washington was back in control of their own destiny alongside Arizona State, their next opponent. This is where the craziness truly begins, so it may help to understand the current championship scenarios broken down by team. By this point, there were actually five teams still alive. Arizona, Arizona State, Washington, USC, and UCLA. However, Arizona's path to the Rose Bowl was messy to say the least. Arizona State had the most direct path to the Pac-10 title. All they had to do was avoid losing either of their next two games. If they managed to avoid a loss in their next game, they could lock up the title with a Washington loss or tie. However, if they lost to Washington, they would need some help during their bye for their finale to impact their Rose Bowl hopes. After beating UCLA, Washington reclaimed their destiny. All they had to do was beat Arizona State and lowly Washington State, and a third straight trip to the Rose Bowl was theirs. However, any blemish over their next two games could spell disaster, and they were out of the race if they failed to win either of those games. As mentioned earlier, USC was ineligible for the Rose Bowl due to probation, but they still had their eyes on a Pac-10 title. However, they did not control their own destiny. In Week 10, USC had to beat Arizona, and Washington had to beat Arizona State for the Trojans to have any shot at finishing first. They then needed to at least tie UCLA in their finale and hope for some extra help in other games to finish as champions. UCLA's chances at a home bowl game were marginal to say the least. At 3-1-1, the Bruins had to win their next two games versus Stanford and USC, then hope ASU lost out, hope the Huskies lost their finale, and hope that Arizona lost or tied either USC or Oregon. Now that we've sorted through that mess, let's get back to the story. USC won 48-41, ending Arizona's Rose Bowl hopes. UCLA beat Stanford 38-35, fending off a furious comeback by the Cardinal in the waning minutes. And for the game of the week, Washington managed a 17-13 victory over ASU to put one hand on the Pac-10 Cup. All they had to do was beat the battered and hopeless Washington State Cougars. The Apple Cup was headed to Pullman for the first time since 1954, as Wazoo had hosted the game in nearby Spokane in even years since 1956. UW hadn't fallen to Wazoo since 1973, and entered as 18-point favorites. The hopes of the rest of the teams alive fell on the backs of the team with only one conference win on the year. Arizona State had the week off, which gave them a chance to rest in case they got a chance to play for a Rose Bowl berth. USC and UCLA were playing at the Rose Bowl. A tie would knock UCLA out of contention, as would a USC win. If UCLA won, they would have to hope for a massive upset in Pullman and a major upset the following week in Tucson. It's November 20th, 1982. If there's any reason this date rings a bell in your mind, it's because of this moment, the ending to the Cal-Stanford game. This was the most insane ending to a game that day, but it wasn't the most impactful, as that was between two mediocre teams. A few hundred miles to the south in Pasadena, USC was driving. With 5.28 to go in the game, USC had the ball at their own 34-yard line after a UCLA punt. They trailed 20-13 and needed to put together a touchdown drive to keep their championship hopes alive. After driving all the way down the field, USC had one play left to save the game and retain the victory bell. With fourth and goal and one second left, 
USC ran a pass play and scored on this Scott Tinsley throw to sophomore tight end Mark Boyer for Boyer's first touchdown of his career and only his fourth catch, too. However, USC coach John Robinson was in no mood for a tie. He sent his offense back out for a potential game-winning two-point conversion. However, Carl Morgan found a hole on the play and collapsed on Tinsley, giving UCLA a miracle victory. Now, they needed a miracle on the other side of the country. But that seems staggeringly unlikely. Wazoo's first possession ended in an interception, and a later fumble set up this Chuck Nelson field goal. Washington entered the half with a 17-7 lead, but the third quarter proved to be a turning point, as an open field fumble by Paul Scancy led to a cleat Casper TD pass to Mike Peterson. The Huskies then muffed the ensuing kickoff, forcing them to start at their own five-yard line. There, they went three and out and punted, giving Wazoo the ball in enemy territory. The conference's second-best ground game struck on a Tim Harris walk-in TD, and the Cougars were shockingly ahead 21-17. The Huskies responded with a field goal in their next drive. It was Nelson's 25th consecutive field goal on the season, a new D1 record. Then, with 4.35 remaining in the game, Washington's drive stalled at the Cougar 15-yard line. Don James sent out the highly reliable Nelson for what should have been a simple 33-yard chip shot. He even had a tee to help his holder. However, in a stunning turn of events, the automatic Nelson missed the kick. But the game wasn't over yet. Washington still had two timeouts and the Cougars could only muster one first down on the ensuing drive. So Washington got the ball at their own 28-yard line with 2.20 remaining. However, after a first down pass, the Cougars came with a safety blitz and strip-sacked QB Tim Cowan. With the ball in field goal range, Jim Walden called three runs up the gut to force the Huskies to burn their timeouts before kicking this 37-yard field goal with 56 seconds left to ice it. When the clock struck triple zeros, the fans rushed the field as the Cougars had avenged the prior year's loss that had kept them out of the Rose Bowl by doing the same to their rivals. USC was finished their Pac-10 slate, but still had their finale against Notre Dame on the horizon. Now, it was down to Arizona State versus Arizona. All Arizona State needed was to avoid losing to Arizona, a team they'd beaten in both of their last two meetings and who had lost their previous two games. If Arizona State lost, they would be out of the Rose Bowl and likely in the Fiesta Bowl, played at their home stadium, while UCLA would also be in a home bowl game, the Rose Bowl. In the end, the Sun Devils collapsed. They only trailed 10-0 after the half, but gave up 16 straight points in the first 4 minutes 45 seconds of the third quarter. Though they tried to muster a comeback, they still lost 28-18, ending their Rose Bowl ambitions and giving UCLA their first outright conference title since 1965. UCLA faced Michigan in the Rose Bowl and won 24-14. Arizona State made the Fiesta Bowl and faced Oklahoma, whom they beat 32-21. Washington got a pretty decent consolation prize, all things considered, as they got to play Maryland in the inaugural Aloha Bowl in Honolulu, a game that also had a dramatic finish. Maryland attempted a 32-yard field goal with 3.39 remaining to try and give them a near-insurmountable 9-point lead. However, the kick fell short, and Washington drove the ball down the field. With 6 seconds left, Tim Cowan hit Anthony Allen on an 11-yard TD strike to tie the game. Then Chuck Nelson hit the extra point to give the Huskies a stunning 21-20 victory. The story of Terry Donahue's first Pac-10 title is the story of fate and drama in college football, and how you'll need more than a little luck paired with skill to succeed in sports. Donahue clearly had that and more. It's why his name lines the halls of Westwood as one of the great legends of the university. And to think that it all started because of one of the most incredible title finishes in college football history. And that's why y'all had to hear the story of Terry Donahue's first Pac-10 title. Thank you. Hey everybody, hope you enjoyed this episode of Y'all Gotta Hear the Story Of. I don't know when the next video is going to be coming out, but stay tuned for it. Meanwhile, if you want to hear other things, I have a live sports podcast every Thursday night at 9pm Eastern. You can find a link to where you can listen to that live uh, in the description. And if you want to listen to something pre-recorded, I do a pretty similar podcast of that style every Friday. And you can find a link to where those are uploaded in the description as well. So... I hope you enjoyed this, thank you, and goodbye.